Welcome on this lovely, wet St. Patrick's Day to FCU, both today and online. Hello, online people. I'm Monica Pillman. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm currently serving as your senior deacon. So I have a few announcements to make. Uh, if you look at your community matters in your order of service, you will see that we're not having a Monday Thursday service this year, though we'll probably pick it up in years to come again. There's an Easter sunrise service at 6.15 a.m. on Telephone Hill in Littleton for those who are interested in watching the sunrise on Easter. And the Women's Alliance is still collecting stuff for refugees in the vestry until March 31st. So if you don't have your shampoos and your soaps and your body wash and all of that stuff that they're looking for yet, you still have a little bit of time to get it gathered up and bring it to FCU. So have a look at the other interesting things that are in your order of service. And that is my, these, those are my announcements for today. Oh, sorry, I forgot something important. Um, everybody look at your cell phones and turn them off, put them into worship mode anyway. And, uh, and if you haven't gotten one of these and a pencil when you came in, you might want to make sure that you get one of those. It'll be a part of the service today. Oh, right. So on Friday, one of my favorite things is happening at FCU. It's game night with potluck. And it'll be in the dining room downstairs. When does it start? Do you remember? 6 p.m. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. That was beautiful. Good morning. Good morning. I join Monica in wel welcoming both people in person and people online this morning. My name is Thea Shapiro. My pronouns are she, her, and I am lucky enough to be the director of religious education in this awesome church filled with wonderful people. So two things before I even start. So see these flowers for St. Patrick's Day? Green for the Protestants, orange for the Catholics. Oh, no. <laughs> what did I say? You do it. <laughs> Green for the Catholics, orange for the Protestants, and white for the Jews. Thank you. I I got it backwards, but it's lovely, and its symbolism is just wonderful. So happy St. Patrick's Day. Uh, this morning we're going to talk about finding joy in hard times. And for the youth and the children, I invite you to go over to the space over there and to draw a clock with your favorite time of day on it that you're going to bring to David. David, raise your hand. 
that's David, who's going to be reading the story, and he will need your clock. So between now and story time, you need to draw your, a clock with your favorite time. Um, and then after that, uh, you guys are going to draw a picture of something that brings you joy. And that can be anything. And just so you all know, after the homily, those little pieces of paper you have, well, actually, after the closing song, we're going to do a meditation and a little sharing. So you don't need to fuss with your little piece of paper. So sit comfortably. Try to let go of what you have to do later. Come into this space. Breathe. Be here. And today's opening words are in honor of St. Patrick's Day, and I chose a blessing by John O'Donohue, a blessing of presence. May you awaken to the mystery of being here and enter the quiet immensity of your own space. May you have joy and peace in the temple of your senses. May you receive great encouragement when new frontiers beckon. May you respond to the call of your gift and find courage to follow its path. May the flame of anger free you from falsity. May warmth of heart keep your presence aflame and anxiety never linger about you. May your outer dignity mirror an inner dignity of soul. May you take the time to celebrate the quiet miracles that seek no attention. May you be consoled in the secret cemetery of your soul. May you experience each day as a sacred gift woven around the heart of wonder. Blessed be. Amen. I need a chalice lighter. So, Elena, would you like to light the chalice? No? <laughs> Zach? All right, Zachary, you go. <laughs> no. And as he lights, if you could share the words of our covenant. And our opening hymn this morning is number 38, Morning Has Broken. And the word should be up on the screen as well as in your book. Please rise in spirit or physically. So today's story will be told by David Grober. Um, it's a little bit longer than the homily because it's an intergen service. So we thought it would be fun to have a nice long story. 
Um, it's written and told by David, and Susan is his costume designer. <laughs> she, she's union, don't worry. <laughs> and then if you do have a um, clock to share with David, please bring it to him. <laughs> you, you may sit. <laughs> This is awesome. Isabel made this clock. Uh, your favorite time of day is, is it nine o'clock? Or twelve? I make it sleep. But <laughs> sleep clock, oh, it's a sleep clock, because her favorite time, of, she loves to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> my, my, my favorite, coincidentally with the story, my favorite time of day was always six o'clock, because I, I, lo I love dinner. Um, Anyone else have a favorite time of day? Okay, well, we got time later. I'm gonna put this down. So th th this, is, this is the first story I ever wrote for my daughter. I write all my stories for my daughter. Uh, 23 years ago, uh, she tended to always or often be late for dinner. So I wrote this. So, once upon a time, not too far from here, uh, there was a king who believed that dinner time was the most important time of the day. And dinner in the castle was always served at exactly six o'clock. And one evening at six o'clock, the king and the queen and everyone who lived in the castle, they were sitting at the dinner table and they were waiting and they were watching their soup get cold. Princess Corinna was late for dinner again. At 6.30, the princess skipped into the great dining hall. Hey, Dad, hey, Mom, hey, everybody. And she started talking all about her busy day. And all the king said was, my soup is cold. That night, the king paced back and forth while the queen watched. Princess Corinna is always late for dinner. What shall we do? Well, she is a busy young lady, the queen said. Yes, yes, but, but, but what shall we do? Let her be, the queen suggested. Do nothing. We can't do nothing. We're the king. The king called himself we, even though there was only one of him. <laughs> the queen smiled. You'll think of something. Good night. But the king could think of nothing. So he called for his trusted old advisors, and he asked them, what shall we do? And the old advisors, they huddled together. Your kingness, we recommend that you stand on your chair and you yell, tell the princess she must be home by 6 p.m. or no dinner for her. Stand on my chair, no dinner? Oh, I don't know about that. The next morning at breakfast, King banged his fist on the table. Corinna, he said, if you are not home for dinner by 6 p.m., you will eat alone in your room. She glared at her father. You're treating me like a child. And she left. Everyone had a busy day, and that night everyone sat and waited. 6 p.m., 6.30, 7 p.m., 7.30. Finally, at 8 o'clock, the princess arrived and said to her mother, Oh, sorry I'm late. That sweet prince next door invited me to join his family for dinner. I'm so tired. Good night. And she kissed the queen and went to her room. The king looked like he might pop. <laughs> Later that night, the king called again for his old advisors. What shall we do? What shall we do? And the old advisors huddled together. Your kingness, we recommend that the princess carry the big castle clock with her all day. Carry the big clock? I don't know about that. Thank you. The next morning, the king, the king gave Corinna a smaller clock on a chain to wear around her neck. Now, dear, you'll always know the time. Gee, thanks, Dad, I guess. Everyone had a heavy day, 
especially the princess. The clock felt so heavy she thought her head would snap off. So Corinna removed the clock. Oh, and then she forgot about the clock, and then she also forgot about the time. And then she spent hours looking for the clock. Six, seven, eight, nine p.m. Everyone waited, soup cold. Corinna came home exhausted. Dad, just don't say a word. Later that night, the king called for his old advisors. What shall I do? What shall I do? <laughs> Your kingness, we recommend you place the clock on a little wagon for the princess to pull along behind her. Furthermore, we recommend you set the clock one hour ahead. So when it is 5 p.m., the princess will think it is 6 p.m. and she'll hurry home for dinner. Clock on a wagon? One hour ahead, I don't know about that. In the morning, the king gave Corinna another present, a wristwatch made especially by the king's clockmaker to run one hour ahead. Everyone had a fast day. By 5 p.m., Corinna's new watch told her it was 6 p.m. Corinna looked at the sun in the sky. She knew something was wrong. The sun wasn't wrong. Oh, dear, the watch must be broken. She went to see the clockmaker, who insisted that her watch must be correct. But when the princess showed him that every other clock in his shop was set an hour earlier than her watch, the now red-faced clockmaker said, yes, yes, princess, of course, I'll fix it right away. And by the time he was finished, well, it was after six, Corinna stopped by her favorite meadow to pick some flowers for her father. But when she arrived home after seven, the king was nowhere to be found. He wasn't feeling well, the queen told her. He went to bed early. Late that night, the king called again for his old advisors. What shall I do? What shall I do? <laughs> Kingness, we recommend that you set the princess's wristwatch and all the clocks everywhere in the kingdom to run two hours ahead. So when it is 4 p.m., the princess will think it is 6 p.m. and she'll hurry home for dinner. All the clocks two hours ahead? Oh, all right, let's do it your way. Go change all the clocks. Everyone had a confusing day. Confusing because now every clock everywhere in the kingdom was set two hours ahead. At lunchtime, Corinna looked at her wristwatch and was surprised to see that it showed 3 p.m., yet the sun was still high in the sky. Oh, dear, it must be broken again. And once again, she brought the watch to the clockmaker, who once again insisted the watch must be correct. Look, princess, every clock in my shop shows the same time. Corinna looked at the sun in the sky. She knew something was wrong. And she said to the clockmaker, come, take a walk with me to the meadow. Well, meanwhile, meanwhile, back at the castle, the king and queen sat at the dinner table and waited and waited until, the, until nearly 9 p.m., which was actually 7 p.m. And then they went to bed hungry. And late that night, the queen said to the king, I hear the clocks got all mixed up today. Oh, said the king sadly. Yes, I hear Corinna told the clockmaker that all the clocks were wrong. Oh, did she? Yes, and then Corinna invited the clockmaker to take a walk up to the, her favorite meadow to show him the sun. The townspeople all followed. They did? Yes, and everyone sat on the meadow and watched the sunset and listened to Corinna tell her stories. All that happened while I sat Waiting at the dinner table? Yes, said the queen, that's what I hear. The king told the queen that he must attend to some important business, and it was after midnight when the king threw on his coat and left the castle. The next morning, Corinna asked, where's dad? And the queen didn't know what to say. Mom, I'm worried about him. I will be home by 6 p.m. Everyone had a long day, but the princess arrived for dinner at exactly 6, and she waited at the table and she watched her soup get cold. 6.30, 7, 7.30. At 8 p.m., the king arrived. He sat down quietly. Corinna stared at her father. The king turned to his daughter. Last night, Corinna, I left the castle after midnight. You did? Yes, yes, I did. You know, and that full moon, it shone so bright and low in the western sky, so I walked to the meadow, your, to your meadow. Did. Yes, yes, and I watched the moon set and the stars, Corinna. 
You should have seen the stars. The night was so beautiful. I couldn't sleep. I stayed up to watch the sunrise. You did? And by the time the sun, it was high in the sky, I, I was so tired. I laid down in the meadow and, and I slept for hours. When I woke, it was nearly dinner time, but I, I, I couldn't hurry home because, because that beautiful sun was spreading its soft pinks and purples across the sky. I, I had to stay and watch the sunset. Corinna and everyone at the table stared at the king. He sipped his soup. And do you know something, Corinna? <laughs> My soup is stone cold. And the king laughed, and Corinna laughed, and everyone laughed along with them. Once upon a time, not too far from here, there lived a king who believed dinner time was an most important time of the day. And dinner was served at approximately 6 p.m. on most evenings. Some evenings the princess was late, some evenings the king was late. And every now and then, when father and daughter were both late for dinner, everyone knew that there must be a beautiful sunset up on the meadow. Thanks.
So I invite you to take a moment and close your eyes and think of those shared joys and the concerns that have not been shared this morning. We all carry sorrows along with our joys. And to think of all of those people you know who struggle and all the joys that they also have in their lives. Blessed be and amen. Good morning. Um, every form of uh, government that exists has some things in common from nations to churches. One of those things is that organizations need money to pay for operations. This can be called dues or fees or tariffs or taxes or pledges or contributions. But without them, the organization will starve to death and cease to exist. This is your opportunity to support our church. For those watching <coughs> remotely, please send your tax deductible checks to FCU 19 Foster Street, Littleton, Mass., 01460 or go to our website fculittle.org and click the yellow donate button. Our offering will now be given and received in grateful appreciation.
please join with me in the words of our community response. We are grateful for the opportunity to give and serve and grateful for the gifts we have received. May this affirm the ministries of our church community, both within and beyond these walls. So um, some of you, or most of you, got a little yellow sheet of paper, which uh, just has a list of four little things. I thought of four, even number. It was in the order of worship, a little square. Yeah. And it just lists four things that you can uh, try and remember to do to bring you joy when you're having a tough day. So my homily this morning is really a letter. My dear friends, how are you today? I hope you're well. I'm writing to you because I've been thinking about how we're living in such hard times, and it's so easy to feel bad these days. Some of my friends don't even think we deserve to feel joy with everything going on in this world. I can't agree with that. Just the other day, I was scanning the internet, looking for things about joy. And I came across these two wonderful videos. One was of a woman who said she liked to read stories to children in Gaza at bedtime to help them be transported somewhere else and to forget about the war for a few moments. It made them smile and it gave her joy. I also read about a dance teacher in the Ukraine who with her husband has a stu dance studio for children to come. Just, they can just come. And the aim is to create a safe space for the children to escape the war for a few hours a day. And they play games and they dance. And her goal is to bring some joy into their lives. And I was just amazed at the ability of these people to find ways to feel joy in such hard places. Yet the more I learn about joy versus happiness, the more I kind of understand people's ability to bring joy when things are hard. Joy is a more spiritual feeling than happiness. You can actually still feel it, even when you don't feel happy. Douglas Abrams says in the Book of Joy that Archbishop, what, I'm sorry, what Archbishop Desmond Tutu and the Dalai Lama were saying is that we heal our own pain, I'm so, goodness, that the way we heal our own pain is by turning to the pain of others. It's a virtuous cycle. The more we turn toward others, the more joy we experience. And the more joy we experience, the more joy we bring to others. The goal is not to create joy for ourselves, but as the archbishop so poetically phrased it, to be a reservoir of joy, an oasis of peace, a pool of serenity that can ripple out to all those around you. And he goes on to say that joy is, in fact, quite contagious, as is love, compassion, and generosity. When I read that, I thought about how we have the ability to hold emotions that at first glance seem so diametrically opposed, like living in a war zone and dancing. In the same book, Desmond Tutu goes on to say, Discovering more joy does not mean, I am sorry to say, it does not save us from the inevitability of hardship and heartbreak. In fact, we may cry more easily. We may laugh more easily, too. Perhaps we are just more alive. Yet as we discover more joy, we can face suffering in a way that ennobles rather than embitters. We, we have hardships without becoming hard, and we have heartbreak without becoming broken. I love that. How beautiful is that? How lucky are we to have the ability to find joy when we're hurt? So this book got me thinking about how to bring joy into my own life. So, of course, I turned to the internet, and not to my surprise, everything I read says, gratitude. I thought, how cliche is this? 
everyone says this, from pop psych magazines to every holistic place online, and even some of my friends. But this guy, a Harvard researcher and lecturer, on 21 Days to Inspire Positive Change, Sean Anker says, something as simple as writing down three things you're grateful for, for, for every day, for 21 days in a row, significantly increases your level of optimism. And it holds for the next six months. I'm gonna try it. You wanna join me? I can set up a Google Doc and we can share it for 21 days and see where it takes us. Let me know if you're interested. I'm also gonna try and be kinder and more helpful to others, like the woman reading to children in a war zone. Because I said in the beginning of this letter, we're living in hard times. And I, for one, am searching to feel good. I want to close this letter with the words of the Dalai Lama that ring true for me these days, and maybe for you too. He says, when we have the courage to live with an open heart, we're able to feel our pain and the pain of others, but we are able to experience more joy. I, for one, am going to try it, and I invite you to join me. In love and gratitude, faithfully yours, Thea. So we're going to sing number 1053 in the green hymnal or blue hymnal or teal. Um, How could anyone? And I think the words will be up on the screen. So please rise in spirit or physically. your feet on the floor, feel your body, sit in a comfortable position, close your eyes, and take some breaths, and then just for a moment, clear your mind as much as you can by just breathing and feeling your body in this space. And then I invite you to think of a joy from this week, and if you've had a bad week, the week before, or even a moment that brought you joy, feeling the sun the other day on your face. Anything, seeing a crocus coming up, it can be so tiny, but it can bring you a smile. It can make you feel that joy. So see if you notice that. And if other joys come in, accept them, let them come. And then see if you can feel that joy in your body. If you can feel the warmth. How your body feels when you feel joy. See if you notice that. Does your heart feel warm? Does your body feel warm? Do you notice the air around you? 
and sit with that for a moment. Don't let anything but good thoughts come in. They'll creep in. Try and get that joy back. And then take a nice deep breath. And then when you're ready, open your eyes. And on that little piece of paper, and on with your little pencil, write a joy. And literally could be the tiniest or the biggest thing you can imagine. And then when you've written it, once you're ready, I invite you to come up and hang it on our little board of joy so we can share. And you are um, welcome to share it. There's a mic there. You can say what your joy is or you can just place it on the board. And I'll start so you see what to do. And excuse my writing. Joy was about how I felt when the sun was out the other day. My joy is learning something new. When I feel joyful, I hum, and I don't even notice it. So I love singing and humming and playing my uke. This is true. <laughs> Walking in the sun. I had two joys, my granddaughter, Marlo, and maple syrup. <laughs> Playing ukulele with my friends and my soft furry kitties in my lap. Spending time at our lake house and walking to the dam. My three-year-old granddaughter and her joy at learning every day. Zooming weekly with my family who are all over the country. Spring peepers and wood frogs singing in the woods. Yesterday. Yeah. Hugh and I have that same grandbaby. Her smile is just amazing. And teens are talking openly about sex. Uh, taking a walk last Sunday with Ada, our granddaughter. Reading books with my granddaughter and yarn. If anyone at has home, if anyone at home has a joy, you can raise your hand and we'll Singing call on you. Singing today's anthem uh, at rehearsal and today. Springtime sun. riding my bicycle and listening to, to today's anthem. <laughs> Singing in harmony. <laughs> Walk and talks with my, on the cell phone with my daughter. <laughs> Being with my grandkids, and they're coming over later today. My joy is people's smiles, and Bill's joy is spring flowers. Time spent with friends and family. Yeah. 
sorry. <laughs> Getting close with my fellow congregants. No. <laughs> Actually, what I, what I wrote was, the trust and faith my loved ones place in me to be there for them. Mine was the same as Bill, seeing other people smile. The moon, the beautiful, beautiful moon. My tulips are coming up, even though I bought them at 50% off, and it, the ground was already frozen when I put them in. <laughs> Dining out in lively restaurants like the Emerald Rose in Billerica. Hand drawing and coloring letters on a new cartoon. I have great joy in being where I am, at the intersection of now. <laughs> and there's nothing like it. It's, it's exciting. Jack says, basketball with Zachary and Henry. And I say, being at the ocean with my family. Baseball spring training because it's streamed over the internet while I work and I can listen to it. Um, I have the first cup of coffee early in the morning <laughs> when I'm the only one awake. <laughs> and, um, and being out in nature, either alone or with my family. <laughs> A new skill for me of posting the trot when horseback riding. I wrote, I wrote my communities, but it all should be, also should be seeing I was apart for a month, being back together. Bob, grab the mic. <laughs> seeing my friend Gideon. Brilliant blue sky in the mountains and hugs with friends, many in this room. Chocolate. <laughs> and unexpected kindness when I visit prison and volunteer. Uh, combining being useful with upper body strength training <laughs> and, uh, and my dog Sam any from home yeah. no thank you all for sharing that was lovely sharing joys is just as important as sharing anything else and What's amazing about them is we find so many of them are joys that we all share. So I invite you to stand for closing words. Yeah, my hand's freezing. It's only water, nothing will happen. So I invite you to feel as much joy as you can. Even when you're feeling sad, find those little moments to feel the sun, to notice something tiny, to hear the sounds around you, and to share with someone who may not be feeling joy at the moment. And may we all go out into the world 
with a little bit of extra to share and shine. Blessed be. Amen. And now it's dance time. Zoom people, I want to see you moving. Come on, Jim.